Welcome to Human Behavior and Sustainable Development. This week, we'll be talking about evolution, behavior, and sustainability. So what is evolution? If you hear the concept, the term evolution, you might associate it with some of these sort of cultural icons of of the idea. Maybe you think of Charles Darwin, or dinosaurs, or genes, or the tree of life, or this march of progress graphic that is now popularly recreated on t-shirts and TV shows uh, of human evolution. These are the kinds of images that may be evoked with the term evolution, but we want to think a little bit deeper about what is this concept? What does it mean? So one way to think about the concept of evolution is to think about examples and non-examples of evolution. So I'm going to just read through a few examples and in your mind, think about whether these are uh, these would classify as examples of evolution, or would they be non-examples, something that you wouldn't say is related to evolution as you understand it. So over many generations, the fur of an animal species changes from dark to light, better matching the environment. The parent cells of a developing embryo differentiate into many kinds of specialized cells. A cancer is spreading in a patient's body. The use of cell phones increases around the world. A tweet becomes viral as more and more people start to like it and share it. Ocean levels are rising due to climate change. Sarah is spending more and more time each day practicing the violin. A young chimpanzee imitates the use of a simple tool from another member of its group. Due to climate change, a bird species has changed its migration behavior. Countries in which people had stronger trust in the government and in science were more successful in fighting COVID-19. So where did you put these? How many of these would you say are examples of evolutionary change and how much how many would you say are not examples, not worthy of, uh, not helpful to be called examples of evolutionary change? Well, if you're a scientist or a, a professional uh, academic, you might have different views depending on what discipline you're in. For example, some classic evolutionary biologists may say that this is the only example, that only this example of camouflage of an animal species uh, cha- having its uh, fur changed at the population level to better match the environment. Maybe this is the only actual example of evolution. Still, if you ask other kinds of biologists, they may say, well, actually, the way that parent cells, the way that an embryo develops, the way that uh, cancer develops and spreads resemble evolution because of the kind of genetic change component. And so you might find other biologists that would expand that list a little. Now, if you look in the human sciences, you might see people that accept some formulation of biological evolution, but they might also say, well, these examples of culture in humans and even non-human animals, uh, that this kind of social transmission uh, would also be helpful to think about as evolutionary change but that surely there are limits to this that other examples may not be still. And if you look across universities in in research and in academic departments, you could still find other people that may argue that, in fact, all of these could be considered uh, examples of evolutionary change within complex adaptive systems. And this is actually something that's being debated Uh, intensively as to how do we exactly define what counts as evolutionary change. So rather than give you uh, one answer or tell you that one subject area, one discipline has uh, successfully found this answer, let's think more deeply about how you and how others think about this concept, this concept of evolution. 
So what kind of words uh, might you have used to define or describe the concept of evolution? You might say something like, it's about the origin of the species. It's about the history of life on Earth. It's about how organisms become adapted to their environment. It's about natural selection. You might say it's about the survival of the fittest. Uh, it's about competition between organisms. Or it's about how organisms, populations, and species change over time. These are common answer, uh, answers that we get. On the other hand, you probably also use the word evolution or to evolve, or have seen it used more generally. For example, you might know the expression, my thoughts on this matter have evolved a lot, or technology in the 21st century is evolving quickly. Agriculture evolved about 10,000 years ago. Our project is evolving nicely. So what does to evolve, what does evolution mean in these contexts? We, rather than give you uh, simple, clear answers, what we want you to be able to do is think about this concept and how it can be used more narrowly uh, or more generally. And the idea that even scientists are actually still trying to think about how narrow or general should we conceptualize this idea of evolution. So to help you orient so that we can have some clarity, some level of definition, we're gonna offer you two different definitions on in this literature. So for many classically trained biologists, uh, may adopt a purely gene-centered definition of evolution. And that would mean that, it's, that evolution is a change in the frequencies of genes or alleles within a population. That means that evolution is happening only when genetic change happens within a population of organisms. And so this would be a more narrow definition. This is what most students are learning in biology class. But there is, in fact, a uh, large and diverse tradition of thinking about evolution in more general and systemized terms. So uh, the alternative to a gene-centered definition is to focus on a trait-centered or more generalized concept of evolution. So we can think of this as a change in the frequencies of characteristics or traits within a population or even more generally in a complex system. And so let's think about this a little more. Generally, we'll be using this second, more general definition. It doesn't mean we don't talk about genes, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, in fact, genes are quite important uh, and one source of information within evolution. Uh, but our trait-centered model will allow us to think about the evolution of, uh, of changes in our world that are relevant to our own well-being and to sustainability. In fact, in an article that we published in 2020, we argued that evolution education, as it's commonly taught in places like Germany or the United States or elsewhere in Europe, is often adopting this gene-centered approach and not allowing students to think clearly about this concept, what is evolution? And so we're suggesting that this trait-centered approach, focusing on the change of trait frequencies within systems, can actually help us teach evolution in a more interdisciplinary way and may actually have added benefits. We use this metaphor of a fitness landscape, which is commonly used in evolutionary biology and also cultural evolution science, to illustrate how progress in evolution education might be inherently constrained at a lower level of potential um, than if we were to take this more interdisciplinary approach. And so here, fitness peaks could correspond to varying degrees of cultural acceptance, uh, but also a depth of conceptual understanding of core evolutionary concepts. So just to make this point a little more clear, 
Some people, some scientists, may be more interested in studying evolution in the, in the sense of looking at how genes change over time, over phylogeny, meaning over the generations of organisms uh, uh, over long periods of time. And so maybe thinking about evolution only in terms of how genes are selected by environments. And actually, this approach has been very productive for biology over the last uh, 50, 50 to 100 years, but it may not be the only way to think about evolution. So it can sometimes be more helpful, we argue, to think about evolution as all of the change that is happening to environments, behaviors, bodies, brains, genes, and cultures of organisms as they interact and shape each other over different scales of time, both shorter term and longer term. And so this is what we're calling this trait-centered approach to understanding evolution. And importantly, uh, we can think about evolution in a more general sense, that it helps us understand how change happens in the biological world and also in the world created by biological organisms. So we can think about evolution as a change of genes, bodies, brains, behaviors in populations of organisms and species. We can think about it as a change in culture, technologies, knowledge, norms, traditions, beliefs, social systems, institutions. We can also think about it as a change of behavior in individuals, what we call learning, which is also can be thought of as an evolutionary process, just as evolution can also be thought of as a learning process. And we can think about it as a change of antibodies in individuals, for example, in the immune system. And perhaps more controversially or, or more uh, complex to conceptualize is the idea that it can even include the idea of change in ecosystems uh, as shaped by the behaviors of organisms to some degree. And that's probably one of the areas uh, most contentious in, in thinking about how evolution might apply to these different kinds of levels. Um, but evolution, evolutionary change definitely happens to culture in humans and other animals. And evolutionary change can certainly happen on many levels, especially in individuals and groups of organisms. So, when we link, try to think back to how does this relate to sustainability, we can think about cultural change as cultural evolution. And we can look at how, uh, how different traits are changing over time. So if you download these slides, you can click on these graphs to go to the website Our World in Data, which has many such graphs. And we can think about how our world is changing, how different traits are increasing or decreasing in populations, in global populations or local populations. These are traits that are relevant to sustainability. And these changes are not random, so we can begin to ask what causes these changes. There's still a lot to learn and discuss about what this concept of evolution is and how we can relate it to be human behavior and sustainability. So join us in the next video to continue thinking about the nature of evolutionary change and how it can help us build a better world.